and we are good to go. You may go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting of the uh, Infrastructure Bond Engagement Steering Committee uh, to order. And uh, Kelly, would you call a roll? Yes, sir. Member Gonzalez? Aye. Uh, Member Hoy? Here. Member Stapleton? Here. Member Varney? Here. Chair Bennett? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first uh, item of business is uh, approval of the um, minutes from the 28th. Chris, I'm you want to? I move approval of the minutes. As okay. Um, any objection? Okay, very good. Okay, we'll go then to uh, public comment. And we do have some. Victor Dodier, you're up first. Three minutes. There we go. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Bennett, committee members. Um, I am Victor Dodier. I am the chair of the SCAN Transportation Committee. We submitted written comments. Um, we suggested that the Pringle Creek path be deferred from the infrastructure bond funding in previous comments. We also questioned the inclusion of the State Street uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Improvements Project. Uh, both are good projects, but both are expensive uh, projects that only add short segments to the bicycle path network. In their place, we suggest a smaller amount of bound funds should be set aside in a bucket to implement tier one bicycle projects that are identified in the Salem Transportation Plan. The projects um, have the potential of developing a network of connected paths across the city. The tier one bicycle projects, especially those that are not on high speed arterials, will encourage, will encourage bicycling to and from the Salem downtown area. The objective of our comment is to create a network of, of connected bicycle paths. We understand that Councillor Stapleton may suggest the bike vision proposal for funding uh, within the bond infrastructure bond. The bike vision pro, uh, proposal would also create a network of connected bicycle routes. We support the bicycle bike vision proposal. Again, our emphasis is on creating a network of connected bicycle routes. The engagement committee members expressed strong interest in funding a Marine Drive Northwest project during its last two meetings. Its large project budget will displace many projects from funding and unbalance the distribution of bond funds, bond funds across city wards. In previous comments, we suggested that the engagement committee explore the possibility of scaling the project back so as to build a functional, but less expensive segment of the Marine Drive Within, with bond funds. Mr. Steve Anderson, uh, speaking for the executive board of the West Salem Neighborhood Association, made a, specific, a more specific proposal for building a smaller functional segment of Marine Drive. We support that recommendation. The staff rebuttal to Mr. Anderson's proposal would, was that it would be less expensive to build the whole project at once rather than to segment or phase it. That's a truism when there are sufficient funds to meet needs. Thanks, process. Mr. Thank appreciate it. Okay, Steve Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Virginia. Thank you so much. Victor, thank you so much for coming down. I really appreciate it. I've listened um, to your comments the last couple of meetings. And um, one of the questions that I have for you is that for me, it's not typical to have somebody from a neighborhood association uh, come and say, this is a really great project that's going to take place in our neighborhood, but we'd like you to pull it um, and not do it. And so could you share with us a little bit about the heart behind those comments, um, the ideas? I mean, this project is going to be amazing when it's completed. And I know that you are in favor of the project as a whole, but just not with these funds. 
um, and to really see them moved in a, in a different area where maybe, um, I guess what I'm gathering from you is that we could use those funds instead to connect a lot more of the bike infrastructure that we have, um, but bolster it to be more comfortable and safer for folks who are biking. Could you just talk a little bit about um, how you guys came to this conclusion to pull this from the project list and, and really divert your attention elsewhere? Well, to be clear, we've uh, SCAN has supported um, the city's application to ODOT for community paths money in, I think, the last year. Um, we're, we have tier one bicycle projects within SCAN and connecting SCAN to the neighborhoods to the south uh, as well. Uh, we were successful in making in recommending to the city that the winter maple bicycle path be continued across uh, Wilson Park, through Bush's Pasture Park, and all the way down to Clark Creek Park. Uh, I haven't ridden that project, that path myself yet, but I understand that there are uh, signage out there. That's a good thing. Uh, we need more of that. And in some instances, there are other instances in, this, in the city where those projects, which are typically inexpensive, but they will need help crossing major arterials or uh, high volume collectors. Um, Winter Maple crosses Broadway, for instance, and there's a um, uh, a, a pedestrian island and uh, a, 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 that it facilitates the crossing. We simply think that the the Clark the the Pringle Creek path is just a little too expensive, and we think the less expensive bicycle paths would be a better way for the city to spend its revenues. Thank you. I just have one follow up, if it's okay, Mayor. Yeah. Um, and that is about Marine Drive. Um, you know, Marine Drive is going to is slated to have a really wonderful separated bike and pedestrian infrastructure along it. Um, and I understand that um, you're interested in seeing that project scale backed uh, or scaled back. Um, my question is, if we could continue that bike and pedestrian infrastructure all the way to the park, um, would that be something that SCAN would be in favor of? <laughs> For less than 47 million, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Victor. Okay, any other questions for Victor? Okay, Steve Anderson. Okay, um, let me share my screen here real quick before we get started. Uh, you have that PowerPoint up? Yep. All right, so. Last time we talked about the cameo of Fifth Street alignment to Herit, and Mr. Mayor, you offered a, uh, an opinion that the whole neighborhood would want the whole thing from Glen Creek. Let me share with you just a few facts that share where the Neighborhood Association is. I'm speaking officially as a representative. Back in 19, uh, well, 2017, here's what was put forth by the Neighborhood Association. We were asked to look at the right of way and how to spend the bond money going forward for 10 years. It was our recommendation at that time to go from 5th to Cameo to Marine Drive. The, on the right, you see the, the information from the Public Works Department on a regional connection from Glen Creek North and the Neighborhood Association on the left. I'll let you guys read that later, but basically in 2017, we've looked at this diagram. And if you look down here at the bottom, this is the alignment along the park. It goes next to a HUD housing, which is a federal nexus, it's a repairing area and bikes. So the cost here, I don't believe has been factored in by the city at this point. This is a very costly strip of land to develop. We believe that the fifth street at Cameo North to Herit makes more sense and is more cost effective. As you look at this Marine Drive here at the uh, Wallace Park Apartments going across the forested area to the right and the farmland here drops from an elevation of 140 to 128 feet. There are some issues there of repairing areas, a floodplain and other stuff that make that section a costly development. And this is just an overview of where Marine Drive ends at the Wallace Park Apartments. And so here's a picture from River Band looking back. You can just see the apartments here in the background. The Wallace Apartments are over here. There's another building here, but this is farmland. This is the forest that you have to go through. A difficult 
but not, uh, it's expensive, but not outside. So the point that we're making as neighborhood associations, we support the Fifth Street at Cameo alignment to Herrick Drive as the preferred alternative in the neighborhood right now. It's been that way since 2017. The Neighborhood Association worked with the community on that. We think it's cost effective. Back in 2020, we again pulled the neighborhood. We went to Councilor Kayser, brought that motion forward to the City Council. City Council adopted that and uh, that alignment as the way to buy the right of way. It's supported by the Neighborhood Association now. So as far as community support, we believe a cost-effective preferred alternative at this time is Cameo, Fifth Street at Cameo to Herrick Drive. And we believe it's acceptable. And we think that that allows some of the other bond funds to be used across the Thanks, city Steve. where these needed. Appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Steve? Yeah, Chris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Steve, for your testimony. Just to clarify, I think I heard you say that this has been the neighborhood's position since 2017 consistently through all the different leadership changes. That hasn't changed. Councilor Hoy, that has been the position since 2017 through the different leadership changes till now. Thank you. Okay. Why don't we try to get the screen? Well, let me see if I can do it myself. Oh, shoot. There we go. Sorry. We're off then. To get my Thank screen you. back together here after that. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Okay, Jason Cox. I'm going to reposition myself. Um, good morning. Um, good morning. African, my name is Jason Cox. I live in Ward 7. If you want to take a walk on the route, on the wild side, take a trip in the unprotected bike lanes on Lancaster Drive or Portland Road at rush hour. It's an instructive experience. While technically a bike lane, um, it's scary and dangerous, and I consider myself a fairly strong bike rider. I'd never take my wife or daughter on such an experience. Our current unprotected bike lane system serves only those with the nerve and experience to ride alongside distracted drivers, large trucks, and other vehicles. It's a half-hearted attempt at encouraging travel on bicycle, and in fact, I consider it counterproductive. The current system does not serve families who want to experience their city and uh, get some activity at the same time. It does not serve the underprivileged who cannot afford a reliable vehicle with the rising cost of fuel. It does not serve people who cannot compete with vehicle traffic on the roads, which is pretty much all of us. It doesn't serve people who want to reduce their carbon emissions by reducing vehicle miles. It doesn't serve people who want to improve their health by incorporate bicycling into their daily activities. So that's why I'm encouraging you to support the uh, 55 mile protected bike lane system uh, proposed by Councillor Stapleton, Ian Davidson and Dylan McDowell. Protected bike lanes are good for business. Studies have shown businesses benefit and commercial property owners see viewer vacancies along protected bike lanes. Protected bike lanes are good for safety. Mm -hmm. A New York study showed a decrease in crashes, speeding and sidewalk riding when they installed a protected bike lane on Columbus Avenue. Protected bike lanes are good for public health. Every city that has tried protected bike lanes has seen more people riding, receiving the physical and mental benefits of getting out and moving. And what's nice about this is it's not something where you have to carve time out of your day to take a trip to the gym or hit the exercise bike because you can just build it into your daily activities. I can get my workout in while I'm going to work. Um, and, um, you know, with the climate crisis, it's a simple way to reduce vehicle trips and associated carbon emissions. The protected bike lane corridors that have been proposed would go a long way towards making Salem, and if you hear or see my cat, I apologize, would go a long way towards making Salem a truly bike friendly city and provide broad benefits, even those to ne who never ride. In fact, uh, I would imagine that many of those who aren't riding today uh, would become riders if they had this safer option. Uh, I really hope you include the, this proposal in the November 22 bond package. Thank you. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, Jason. Have you seen a copy of this yet, of the proposal? Have I? Um, yeah. I haven't, I'll confess, I haven't analyzed it closely. Um, okay. I, I haven't either. I haven't seen it yet. So I, I just wondered. Um, I, you know, I'm for it. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I, Whatever I, it I is. I've read okay. the articles in the paper. I've signed the petition. I've looked at the map through ArcGIS. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd have to look closer to give you specific recommendations on routes and that kind of thing. Right. But, so you'd like to have a shot at it anyway, let the public take a look at it at some point. Is that your? Okay, I don't have anyone else signed I'm up. sorry, I'm, I'm having issues. Sorry, sorry, Jason. Okay. Oh, I'm just having internet issues, but um, okay. you had a question for me? No, never mind. Okay, we'll follow up now with uh, staff presentations. Um, Brian, I guess you're on for for these various, for at least some of these presentations. Yes, I am. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Brian Martin, city engineer. That did not work, did it? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. We can see your screen, Brian. Is it the uh, TSDC? Is that showing? Transportation? Yeah. Transportation system development charges background. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, today we wanted to share a little bit of information, uh, TSDCs. Uh, it's been brought up in a couple of the prior meetings about maybe funding some of these projects with TSDCs. And so uh, what I thought I'd do first is share a little bit of background information. Uh, first of all, when developers construct public infrastructure uh, within and adjacent to their development projects, that's a requirement of development. So uh, they go ahead and, and construct infrastructure. Uh, after that infrastructure is completed and the builders come in to develop those lots, they pay the SDCs when they obtain their building permits. And those, SD, those uh, SDCs that are paid by, uh, by the builders are based on the estimated trips that are generated by that development that they're constructing. Uh, those developers are actually due SDC reimbursements for the construction of arterial and collector streets that increase the capacity and are shown on the city's 309 list. Uh, they are not eligible for SDC reimbursement for local streets. So basically, when those developers come in uh, and build and build the infrastructure, the builders obtain the building permits. Generally, there's a portion that's due back to the developers, and those are the SDC reimbursements. Uh, over the past five years, we, we have collected about $2.5 million per year. Uh, that range has been uh, a low of about 1.5 million to a high of about 3.6 million. And in this fiscal year we're in right now, we're projecting about 3 million this year. Uh, likewise, uh, with the CIP, as we've programmed out the next five years, we're anticipating approximately $3 million per year of SDC funding. Now, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a cash cow, I guess I would say. Uh, when we receive those funds, there's administration costs that go into receiving the revenues and, and uh, uh, paying back developer reimbursement charges. Uh, we also have to uh, reimburse developers, as I mentioned in the prior slide, for that work they do on, on arterial and collector streets. We also use that funding as a, as a match for grant applications when we submit for state or federal funding. Uh, we use uh, a portion of that funding for capital improvement projects, and then we also have a, a, a contingency that we keep in that fund in case any of the, uh, the bullets listed above uh, change. And I wanted to share some examples of what TSDCs are programmed for uh, in the existing budget and in the five-year CIP. We have developer reimbursement projects. Uh, I've got eight of them listed here. Uh, work out by East Park, some, some in Coil Run down in South Salem. Uh, there's reimbursements due on Lancaster Drive up at the intersection of Portland Road and Hazel Green Road. Uh, development on Battle Creek Road where the developers building improvements to Battle Creek. Uh, we're still waiting to do final reimbursement for the Cherry Street and Pine intersection improvements. We do have the Lone Oak uh, improvements down with that development going on. 
and um, and actually I listed uh, Portland Road case of green twice, so that's a typo on my part. Uh, as far as grant match projects, uh, we've got several traffic signal improvement projects. They're listed in the first two bullets. Uh, we also have grant match on Hilfiker Lane at Commercial Street. That's a project you saw recently at City Council for getting right away. Uh, we have uh, match funding at Broadway Pine, uh, McClay and Kaplinger. And in the CIP this year, we're proposing a million dollars to go towards McGillchrist Street. We all are also proposing grant match funding at, for commercial uh, street. And uh, that'd be from a drone at a Robbins Lane. And then we also have a couple grants funding for traffic signal upgrades. So that's how we're using the grant match dollars. And I, I would say when we apply for, uh, for grant funding, uh, we receive $9 for every dollar that we spend. So if we, uh, it, it's, it's the most effective way to get dollars into the community by uh, getting as many grants as we can. These are some of the capital improvement projects you'll see in the uh, to be funded with SDCs. We're updating the transportation system plan this coming year. Uh, we got improvements on Lone Oak Road at Reese Hill Road, that intersection down near the new development in the new park property. There's an intersection widening at Hawthorne and Sunnyview. Uh, we've got the Hilfiker Lane and Commercial Street intersection improvements, Broadway at Hood. We have a category of opportunity right away purchases when when uh, people are selling in a location where we have a property that, that um, will be beneficial for one of our future projects, we typically take advantage and purchase right away with those funds. And again, I've got another duplicator with Hawthorne and Sunnyview. Uh, sorry about that. We've got Center Street, and then we've also got Cordon Road and Kubla Boulevard with some signal interconnect. So those are the projects. Chris, did you have a question for Brian? I do. I just was curious about that Hawthorne Northeast Sunnyview Road Northeast intersection widening. What's the purpose there? It's already got turn lanes and you know center turn lanes and that sort of thing. It seems pretty adequate to me. What are you doing there? Well, there's a right turn lane, I believe, northbound to eastbound, and then uh, I think that that allows for a left turn coming from north to south, if I'm not mistaken. So I could get the details for you that here. I'd have to look it up on the budget, but. I definitely know there's a right turn lane going in there. What have you, uh, do you have a, a, a project justification? I know that intersection fairly well, and I wasn't aware of a lot of problems there. What, uh, what, what are the factors that played into this? Have you had a lot of wrecks there? Or are, you having, are you having some serious problems there? That's a great question. I don't have all the history on it, but I could certainly provide it after the meeting or if Peter or Julie want to chime in, they would have information, I'm sure. I, I, Chris, would you be interested in that? I uh, Definitely. I travel that route frequently, daily. Yeah. Sometimes, and it's it seems fine. I don't see what the what we're, problem we're trying to solve, I guess, is what I'm yeah. trying to figure out. Like Chris, I was surprised to see it on the list uh, in that my experience with it, which is several times a week, has been... Uh, that it's been a very, actually been a really well done <laughs> intersection given the amount of traffic going through it. It's, it seems pretty successful. So I'd just be curious kind of what's going on there. Okay, well, I can certainly follow up after the meeting okay. with information on it. Great, thank I, I'd you. I'd much rather see sidewalks out there on Sunnyview that kind of between Hawthorne yeah. and down to uh, Evergreen or wherever they stopped. There's a whole section there with no sidewalks. I'd, I'd rather see money going to that in that area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mayor, May, <clears throat> Peter yeah, Fernandez, Peter. Director. So I think what we have to remember overall is what Brian is discussing is transportation systems development charge funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not operational funding. This is not general I, funding. So I don't know the specifics of this of this project either. It would have to be uh, a project that is due to growth related issues to be TSDC eligible. So, so there's some growth component, and we'll get you the details. But you know, we can't repair potholes. We can't right. uh, install sidewalks without a widening. So this is all about you know addressing uh, impacts due to growth. Uh, and that's what TSDCs go for. So, so that's we we'll, we we'll, we have to remember that underlying right. everything that everything that Brian says about SDCs is these are so so if this project 
uh, I mean, it's already in the CIP, but uh, if the council decided to not, uh, uh, you know, continue in the CIP, then the TSD, the TSDCs would go to another project that's in the list of right. eligible projects. So it can't just go to every any any kind of project. Okay, so if growth, it would not include sidewalks. We typically in, uh, include sidewalks as part of a development, uh, but I do not believe that sidewalks alone. Uh, without any other improvement, are are, uh, are SDC eligible? Could could you look at that in conjunction with this review, though, to see if that if a project like that would be SDC eligible? I mean, growth out there, uh, there is a lot of apartments out there, a lot of people moving around and uh, finding out how they. Unless there is some sort of uh, it's locked in for some other reason that you know, we don't remember or know about, but I, I think kind of understanding that would be real helpful. Uh, and, and, and the justification, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I, there's lots of SDC eligible development going on in this, in this community, but I'm not sure I understand yet why Hawthorne and Sunny, Sunnyview would be on the list. So, I don't know. I think that's kind of one of the questions we're asking is kind of what's going on there. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what problem, we're trying, Chris? I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out what problem we're trying to solve because I'm not aware yeah. of the problem. So yeah. I would just be interested to know what staff's thinking on it is. We can provide you that. Great. Mayor, Thank you very I, much. That'd be helpful. Mayor, could I ask the director a question about this? About this? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I guess for me, I, I would love to see... Um, what qualifies or what are the qualifications for transportation system development charges? Because I think that's going to help me understand why, why this is the way it is. Um, if it's, if it's only for an increase in growth, um, my question would be, how do we change that from being so car centric, um, as in growth equals more vehicles, uh, to a more, uh, encompassing uh, growth equals lots of different increases in transportation, whether that's pedestrian, or bike infrastructure and road uh, and roads for people who are driving vehicles. Um, I would like to see how that is excluded and how we can maybe look forward to changing that in the future to be more encompassing of all modes of transportation. Yeah, and <clears throat> so TSDCs, it, it, system so much charges in general are, uh, you know, we could do several meetings on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to be brief. Uh, system so much charges are specifically laid out by law to uh, address uh, uh, impacts due to growth. Uh, the methodology is related. The vast majority of the dollars collected are based on the amount of uh, vehicle trips that a project is gonna generate, a new project is gonna generate. Uh, we could do an analysis. We, we just updated the methodology recently. Uh, yeah. you, know, you could do an analysis based on how many uh, uh, pedestrian trips are gonna be generated and we, could collect that money, but only that amount of money. So if you didn't want to spend it on cars, then we would generate significantly less dollars on, uh, on SDCs. And uh, so where do these projects come from? Uh, they come from a, uh, a detailed analysis of where growth is going to impact uh, streets. And, uh, and then those projects are put into an eligible list called the 309 list. Uh, which is a number based on the Oregon uh, revised statutes uh, that give us the authority to do this. So it, uh, TSDC dollars can only go to those projects that are listed. That the council you have uh, methodology, uh, you and, and those projects are just uh, are on the list, and, and that list is readily available. We have an SDC committee, right? Well, we had a committee that put the latest. Uh, uh, that that committee doesn't meet. Uh, periodically, that committee was convened and finished its work a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. When we updated the the methodology, but but we can't just do. I mean, th there's well, no. Could, such you, could you provide us with the updated methodology? Sure. I think that's what Virginia is asking for. I certainly. I don't can. think we need to talk it through right here, but I think she could take a look at the methodology and probably, uh, after asking you a couple of questions, pretty well understand just how limited use of these funds right. can be. Right, that's, okay. that's, that's the key, is that they're, okay. they're, they're extreme, by law, they are extremely limited. 
Okay, well, if you would make sure she, she, in fact, maybe all the committee, it would be helpful because we have had SDCs entered into this transportation discussion that everybody get a, at least a dose of the SDC methodology uh, would be helpful. If you, if you wouldn't mind. We'll do. I, I don't think people understand the statutory limitations, some of the other things. It, it is confusing and it's pretty... Yeah, it gets pretty complicated. Okay, sounds good. And I just had one more slide, Mayor, on this, and okay, I think we can finish up here. This is uh, this is where the funding sits uh, over the last five years, and what we're projecting for the five years coming up. And uh, as you can see, the uh, you know the, the pink in the bottom is admin costs. There's developer reimbursements in blue. What's been going towards capital projects in green? Uh, grant mansion, yellow or orange, whatever that is, and then the unspecified contingency. So, um, if if you know if the committee was looking to fund some of these projects with SDCs, it, it would have to come out of some of the contingency, or we would have to re reprioritize projects that are already proposed or funded. And these SDC these SDC funded projects come through the CIP, right, in the budget process? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so th this may be the wrong forum for that discussion, that, that this really is locked up in the CIP and give everybody a chance to, when they get the CIP, get, get started on it in advance of the budget hearings as they start up. It might be in a more appropriate venue for this discussion. Right. I'm a little concerned we get we could get off in the rabbit hole here. Yes, yes. Okay. I think the key is there's not a whole lot there to work with when we're talking about right. some of these larger projects, but there is some. How about the parks and parking lots? Sure. Jennifer Keller is going to uh, lead that discussion. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, run through the presentation. Good afternoon. As Brian mentioned, my name is Jennifer Keller. I'm the Parks Operations and Recreation Services Manager. I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint that was previously shared with Councilors Stapleton and Hoy. Um, we're hoping that it will help provide uh, some additional information as you're weighing the parking lots as a potential bond project. Um, I want to preface by saying that aside from dogs and dark, dog park related issues, the second largest issue that we deal with in parks operations is the parking lots that we've identified uh, as potential projects in the bond. Um, uh, all of the ones that are referenced here are the ones that we hear about on a continual uh, and routine basis with regard to concerns from the public um, relative to their condition. So the first slide is relative to uh, parking lot number three at Minto Brown Island Park. Uh, parking lot three is by far the most par popular parking destination in the park and is heavily used uh, throughout the year. Uh, by paving the lot, which is now uh, a gravel space, it would provide for some more efficient parking area, increase the av availability of spaces, uh, improve the pedestrian ingress and egress process, reduce the maintenance bur burden, and improve stormwater treatment. Uh, maintenance of the lots when they are gravel, uh, we do at least twice a year um, on a major scale. Uh, bringing in additional gravel, compacting that gravel, trying to help uh, deal with the potholes uh, that have developed in those lots. Throughout the year, aside from those two times, we continue to br bring in gravel as, uh, gravel as needed. Um, so by paving that, that would uh, increase uh, the maintenance cost and the, the maintenance impact to our operations division. The second slide, is images that were taken uh, recently on the 24th of March in kind of a mid afternoon. Um, the first image, the top left is uh, one side of, demonstrating that one side of the lot uh, is full of cars. Um, typically there's hesitancy unless all else fails to park on the other side uh, because cars have a fear that they'll be blocked in um, if they park right behind other cars. 
So having not having striping on the gra uh, the gravel lot uh, creates a lack of kind of efficiency and, and the number of spots that are available for users. Um, the second uh, image is uh, really kind of indicating that uh, uh, potentially we could we could help ourselves by adding a little bit of signage to help control the parking in non-designated areas. But we do continue to have cars. Uh, that park there when the lots are full. Um, there's a tendency to just park wherever they think they can they can find a spot or, or fit their vehicle. The third and fourth images on the bottom are really just kind of showing the, the uh, current condition of the asphalt in the paved portion of that particular um, lot. And as you can see um, in some of the slots that it's, uh, it's starting to fail and crack and, and uh, show some wear and tear. Um, in the next slide is uh, photos of parking lot number two um, at Minto Brown Park. Again, this is a gravel parking lot and it serves the dog off leash area. Uh, it's also that particular parking lot is used as the primary uh, trailhead and staging area for the Peter Courtney Minto Island Pedestrian Bridge Path. It's heavily used, uh, similar to parking lot three, um, and it's routinely full on evenings and, and weekends throughout the year. Uh, we continually get, same, similar to parking lot three, uh, calls relative to the maintenance of the parking lot um, and concern by the public uh, with regard to the potholes or, or, or the damage that they think it may uh, do to their car as they're trying to uh, navigate through the lot. Um, so uh, similar to parking lot three, the renovation and paving of the area would improve parking efficiency and increase availability by adding some additional spaces, um, reduce the maintenance bur burden, and again, improve drainage aspects of the parking lot uh, through a stormwater treatment plan. Moving on to the next parking lot, that's at Orchard, Heart, Orchard Heights, excuse me, in West Salem. Uh, we've done a lot of improvements at Orchard Heights. We've added some new um, amenities out there. And with those improvements, uh, the baseball fields and the tennis courts specifically, it's increased demand uh, on those parking lots. The parking lots were always routinely uh, filled. As you can see from the pictures, they as well are beginning to fail with regard to, to cracks. Um, these images that are in these particular slides, the middle slides, um, is kind of a mid-afternoon weekday uh, picture. It's not necessarily indicative of when there's a lot of activity that is going on, on out there um, through the tennis course and the softball fields, um, but it gives you a little bit of insight on how that parking lot um, is used. Uh, the next slides uh, is really um, looking at more what would be typical when we have softball that's going on out there. Orchard Heights uh, typically can be used as an overflow uh, overflowed site uh, for when the, we have tournaments uh, and exceed uh, the number of fields that we need at the star. Um, complex. And so we used Orchard Heights since it's in West, West Salem and, and close uh, to the star for those overflow games. So you can see from the, these photos that cars are packed in there. Um, there's tendency to park, um, again, similar to Minto, anywhere and everywhere uh, that they can that they can park. Um, this project would be an opportunity potentially to add between nine and 12 additional stalls. Um, that additional amount would still be consistent with the park's master plan. The uh, extra parking would help address issues that stem from uh, the reservable use of this park. Um, again, especially the sports field when, that, when, it's, uh, when that's uh, being used. The next slide has to do with uh, Wallace Marine Park, the sport field parking lot pavement project. Again, this is a gravel, large area gravel lot and it serves the sports fields and the water oriented recreational areas. Um, the riverfront at Wallace, uh, the riverfront at Wallace Marine Park, it's a citywide, obviously regional draw, especially during the spring through fall months. 
Um, this similar to Minto and um, Orchard is highly utilized um, and has continual uh, degradation of the lot as years go by. We again try to deal with it a couple of times a year by adding additional gravel and compacting that, but the rains and the continual use um, have a tendency to, uh, the, the gravel will migrate and move. And so, you know, it doesn't take long before um, the impacts of, of what we done, have done um, uh, are, are diminished. And then the last slide that I have is for Cascades Gateway Park. Um, that's uh, adjacent to the parking lot that goes around by Walter Worth uh, Lake. Again, this is a gravel parking lot. It supports the dog park. It supports Walter Worth uh, Lake for the fishing uh, activity that goes along there and along Mill Creek. Um, this park is another citywide regional draw park. Um, uh, obviously, during the last uh, COVID period, um, there was uh, unsheltered population out there, so it was not used in the same capacity as it typically uh, would be utilized. Uh, but we have everything from fishy der fishing derbies to reservable areas um, to disc golf uh, that uh, that the public uses at this particular at this particular park. So those are all the slides uh, that I have, and again, it was just to kind of give you a snapshot and, and some pictures of. Uh, the condition of the of the parking lots and the reasons behind are putting them on the bond list. Great, Councilor Hoy. Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the information. Approximately, how many days a year would you say that the Orchard Park uh, uh, parking lot, or I guess the field, is used as an overflow for tournaments? Well, the season uh, we typically start, uh, well, the season doesn't start until like about April. We have a high demand for folks wanting to reserve it for practice play. So typically beginning of March, we have teams who want to start using it um, around the area to, uh, to, to practice um, uh, and reserve it. But when we're using it as overflow from, from the star, uh, that typically would start in April. And would go so till like October. Every weekend, once once a month, how often? Well, we don't reserve it every weekend uh, for star overflow uh, because we just don't have that size tournaments every weekend that are transpiring. Uh, so typically it would be at least once a month, if not twice a month um, on the weekends, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday combination. But uh, during the season, again, we have a shortage of fields and high demand for field use. So it wouldn't just be the weekends, it would also be the evenings where you have teams who are wanting to reserve and, and do practice play. So it is a little different demand, certainly, than if you're holding tournament over there, but it is, it is still uh, a highly demanded uh, park location. Thank you. Uh-huh. Anyone else? Yes. Uh... Mickey. <laughs> thank you, Sorry. Mayor Bennett. Um, and thank you, Jennifer, for uh, bringing this up. I had a, about four questions. So um, first of all, um, at Cascade Gateways, would, since a lot of the damage occurred during COVID, is that, was that project possibly, uh, could our ARPA funds be used for part of it? So currently that is not the case. The condition and the, and the rationale um, for that is that that was the condition of the parking lot prior to. It had potholders and was a grab potholes and was a gravel lot before the unsheltered were allowed to camp there. Um, certainly we are going to have to rehabilitate regardless of that parking lot given the nature of uh, you know, all of the RVs that were parked there and contamination um, of the material that was left behind uh, in the lot, we would have to do that, um, uh, but uh, certainly on a more extensive level. But my understanding is no, those funds are not available given that it was an existing condition. Kristen, do you wanna take a shot at that one too? Or John? Yeah, I turned my camera on, but I think Jennifer actually, she covered it pretty well. The, okay, the weed. so they are not eligible for ARPA funds despite the damage? Well, the, the other issue is our ARPA funds have all been accounted for. Okay. So we've allocated all of our ARPA funds. Okay. Go ahead. 
I, I, I had a couple of more. Um, I, I'm not a road expert. Um, is the gravel that's used in our parking lots, is it just plain gravel or does it, is it the gravel with the binder in it? I'm just curious. So we use three quarter minus gravel um, that we put in um, and then we compact it. Um, so we, we uh, have a machine that, so, to, so it makes it as tight as it can possibly be to bind. The problem is, is we get so much rain, <laughs> rain here, obviously, as you're all aware throughout the year, um, and then such high use that, that the gravel has a tendency to migrate. So it will, it lasts for a relatively short period of time before it starts migrating. Yeah, it was just a question because I've seen some very successful county roads that have used binder and I was wondering if that was an option. We have not specifically added that to it, no. And I don't know what the additional cost uh, would be. Typically, every time we do this, it's about $10,000 a parking lot that comes out of our operations budget. So it's it's an expensive proposition when we do that. I don't I don't know, to be honest, what the additional um, cost by adding some kind of binder would be and, and if that would be offset in the, in the long run by it, uh, you know, lasting longer. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. One more on Orchard Heights, because um, we, we discussed parking quite a bit uh, when I was on SPRAB. And uh, yeah, Orchard Heights gets a lot of use, especially with the dog park and the new courts. I mean, pickleball and the basketball, and there are a lot of vehicles that do use Orchard Heights. But what I had brought up in Sprab earlier was the use of that grassy area adjacent to the small dog park to use it for overflow. And I know we discussed it, but Jennifer, could you refresh my memory on why we can't use that for overflow parking? Well, I, I think the concern is, is obviously uh, we have to, uh, it impacts how our ability to maintain it. I think there's difficulty with cars getting in and out of that particular uh, area. Um, and, you know, we typically don't like to have cars park on kind of grassy turf areas, especially in the summer, you know, we have some concerns with regard to fire issues, um, you know, exhaust and things from the cars that, that potentially may ignite something, even if we keep it, you know, try to keep it mowed. So it's not the most efficient use of that, of that area. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Jennifer? Yeah, Jose here, question. Ah, there's Jose, hi. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Jennifer, you know, you, um, thank you for the information. Mm -hmm. It was part, my question was partially answered through Mickey's question as, as far as bringing in new gravel costs us $10,000 every time. I mean, approximately how many pounds of concrete, I mean, uh, gravel are we talking about? And have we been doing this forever? I mean, this is, this is just how we've been doing it all these years, just bringing in $10,000 worth of gravel all these years. Well, the ten thousand dollars is not just for gravel. It's also, you know, the 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 cost that we pay for the services for uh, the gravel itself, the material itself, and then you know the spreading of the gravel and and compacting it and all of that. So it's a it's a full figure. It's not just it's not just for the gravel. Uh, we've been doing this for an, for a, a, a lot of years um, <laughs> uh, and stuff, lots and lots of years. Um, the the concern um, is why we haven't done it. And previous folks have asked us as to why we haven't addressed this, why they haven't been paved, why we continue to just kind of, you know, put a Band-Aid on it kind of the, uh, situation. So these parking lots um, at, currently don't have another funding mechanism um, to take care of. Um, as you can see, obviously, the, in the spreadsheet, these are these are large scale projects um, with with large uh prices uh, associated uh, with by the time you address drainage, uh, drainage and put in stormwater treatment and so forth. And, you know, operations is the one who supports the maintenance of these things. So we don't have uh, funding availability to do anything more than address uh, them uh, in the manner that we've, that we've typically been doing it. They are identified. Um, we have put them on our CIP list for parks. Um, but again, given that the source of funding is general fund and operations, um, they haven't been able to kind of move up that priority 
list uh, because we haven't been able to identify a, a different funding stream uh, that would be eligible to use in these particular parks. Totally understand, Jennifer. And, and yeah, no, I totally understand. I appreciate it. I know you're doing the best you can. And uh, no, it's just interesting to, I hadn't really thought about this. You know, I, had a, I didn't know enough about this to really understand it, but really there's an impact to the environment either way. So it was really interesting to learn that from your presentation, Jennifer. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Virginia, did you? Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jennifer. This is all really helpful. Again, um, it's always great to see a presentation twice because it um, helps it settle into your brain a little bit deeper. Um, a question for you is um, the funding for maintenance of these parking lots, um, that comes through the parks um, and not transportation? And that, that's okay. my question. Is there is there a reasoning for that? Um, you know, these parking lots are, you know, part of our transportation plan, in my opinion, right? The cars need to get somewhere and park somewhere. Um, but it is taken out of the parks money. Is that correct? It's and correct. Not right. They are part of, um, you know, the park itself, the total encapsulation of the acreage of the park. Um, and so, you know, parks are supported by the general fund. Um, uh, and, so yes, they come out of our parks operations budget. That's the funding stream that, that would pay for these. Yeah, Mayor, if I may. So, so the other part of that counselor is that uh, uh, virtually all of our funding in streets comes from the state gas tax. And the state gas tax is very, very specific that it must only be spent, uh, monies can only be spent on, uh, on facilities that are within public rights of way. So clearly parks are not a part of that, uh, of, of that eligibility. That's why we need these these bonds because we <laughs> everything is very siloed, very difficult to fund. Okay. Any further questions on uh, on parks under this on um, parks and parking lots? That's what this part is. It's just parks and parking lots. Any further? Yes. Go ahead, Councilor. I, I'm sorry, this is just a question because I, I don't know. Do we have uh, public transit that, at Minto Brown? That goes into the park? I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Or Yeah, I mean, do we, I just, I just haven't seen a, a bus down there. I was just curious. It's just so. kind of a personal question. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> Um, I think there's buses that go along River Road south down there, but not that actually are right into the park or, you know, adjacent to the park. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll move on then and uh, get back with uh, Josh. We're trying to get these project lists solidified in order to start putting the bond, uh, put the bond together and begin that process of getting it both on the ballot, looking for uh, public reaction and public support, as well as launching a campaign. And we're getting, we're starting to run out of time. So I wanted to uh, be sure we give Josh time to kind of see if, how far we can move forward on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may, I'm going to share my screen and just recap where we're at at the moment. The materials you got in your packet, they included a couple changes, and I apologize for the versions, um, but hopefully the additions were helpful. Um, so for streets and sidewalks, a project description was added to add more detail to the project, so you have a better idea of the scope. So that's for streets and sidewalks and parks. And then the other item that was added is a line for sidewalk replacement. Uh, there was a lot of discussion at the last meeting. So we have a plug for sidewalk replacement and a, a bucket of $10 million. Um, and just so you know, that $10 million, you know, right now it's uh, listed as included in the bond. So that pushes the total of things you've decided plus streets and parks to a total of just about 357 million. Uh, which means there's about 57 million that needs to be reduced to get into that $300 million bucket. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I don't know where you want to start uh, the discussion to move or reallocate projects around. 
Well, have we, uh, Josh, do you or Courtney, do we have any of these areas that we have approved yet to, to move ahead on? Well, we did have a really healthy conversation when we gathered last time about um, some of the smaller component pieces, um, but we did put a pin sort of in it so that we could return to that conversation. And so for right now, um, the, the places that we haven't spent a lot of time is in the parks project area and in the streets and, and sidewalks project area. Um, and we, after we've had conversation about that, we could come back and consider whether you want to adjust um, any of the categories we talked about last time. When you say a pin, do you mean we sort of agreed we should move ahead with them or what are you? We did. We did. Well, which Sorry ones are, why don't you tell us where we are then on what we've agreed to so we can start getting some things off the list so we can get focused on things that. Uh, we need to get onto the list. Yes, thank you. And Josh just brought up the chart again so you can see. Josh, okay. do you want to revisit the Civic Center earthquake security, uh, sorry, earthquake measures, the technology and cybersecurity conversation attaching affordable housing to library branches? Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the areas you guys uh, tentatively approved were the Civic Center earthquake safety at just over 39 million, uh, the technology and cybersecurity at 17.6 million, the sites uh, for affordable housing and library branches at 7.5 million, the affordable housing opportunity funds for 10 million, and then we discussed the fire stations and fire engines equipment, but I'm not certain that we moved those onto the, the list of, hey, this is on the approved side. Okay. I can't see the there. I, okay, what what's your pleasure? Do we want to say those are now we're locking those in and moving forward with those elements of the bond measure and allow us to then take on what'll really be the bigger, the more expensive items? Um, but I, I want to check in to see if that's where we are. Yeah, Chris. I'm ready to move the yellow items off of our off of the committee's list and onto the council, um, and so we can focus on the other stuff. Yeah, let's get into it. Okay, is there any objection to doing that? We would take those elements; they're in yellow. Let's go. Let's go back over there, Josh, just for a second to refresh everyone's. Mr. Mayor, would you like to include the fire items also, the fire stations? I, I don't think so yet. Let's okay. let's hold off on that for just a minute. Uh, unless unless you'd like to, unless the committee would like to do that. If you'd like to move those on, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure we're not uh, moving ahead of everyone's comfort level. I'm fine with moving the fire engines and equipment. I want to have more conversation about future fire stations. About what again, Chris? The future fire stations part of it. I'm good the with location the engines or... and equipment. I want to talk a little bit more about the stations. So let's not let's not move it on yet. Yeah. Uh, what I want to make sure is there's no objections to moving those four elements uh, in yellow onto the per, onto our recommendation to the city council. This is Virginia. I do not have any um, hesitations on that. I'm ready to move those ones in yellow Great. onto council. Great. Okay, then without opposition, we will move those forward. I don't see anything. Okay, good. All right, now let's go to, uh, why don't we go to the fire stations? That uh, probably is the one of the bigger chunks and would really start to define what this is going to look like and let us know what's left for parks and streets. So what do you think, Chris? Well, I'm ready to go down the list and just start having a, I think we should just go down the list and just start having the conversation. Okay. Josh, you want to take us on to that list? Sure, the, uh, the future fire station item doesn't have a, a project list. It's simply two, two fire stations and I believe the chief is on it. Could you like him to speak to those two stations? Uh, 
Okay. There we go. Okay, with two new fire stations. Yes. So we know uh, Niblock's for them. Is there anyone else that's for them? Let's see what we got. Okay. What do you? What's What's up, Chief? Well, these are really uh, of the future. Looking forward, we're talking about a ten-year time period here, and uh, we are in desperate need to add uh, resources and to serve our community. Um, we are not anywhere close to meeting our standards for delivering service to our to our citizens and uh, location is really a big part of that. Northeast uh, is one of the focuses, uh, getting us off the Chemeketa Community College campus and closer to Portland Road. Um, if you've seen any of the, of the red dot maps that I've provided council, um, service up there is, is uh, less than, than we would want for anyone. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> uh, the same can be said for Southeast area, Mill Creek area. Uh, so <clears throat> if, if you take the stations, uh, if you decide to take the stations off of the list, um, what you, these, are, these are expensive facilities. Uh, so you're really deciding that we are not going to grow our, our ability to serve the community for, for the foreseeable future for the next 10 years. I will tell you, we need four to five new stations. <laughs> um, uh, to really serve the community properly. Uh, we put two on here to try to be respectful of, you know, let's build a little bit at a time and let's, let's have a, 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 sl a slower slide into this so it's not a sticker shock. Um, and I realize there's a lot of needs out there in the community. Um, this one, I think with the seeing our, our call volume growth, it's been pretty steady the last few years and it's continuing this year. Uh, if we don't make some changes fairly soon, we're going to be uh, sub sub 50 percent uh, of the time uh, getting there when people have emergencies. And that really begins to impact uh, quality of life uh, and life itself for some some individuals. So that's why this is on the list. OK. Councilor Hoy. Thanks, Mayor. What's the plant, the operational cost associated with each of those, Chief? So we're talking about um, for a station like that about two and a half, two point two million dollars a year operational costs. Um, we realize, as 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 most of you have, uh, have, I've had the opportunity to speak to most of you about our moving forward operational costs um, with five fire stations. It's forty five. Uh, it's uh, twelve million a year uh, to meet the standard that we have. It's it's twenty five million a year. So we are so far behind. Um, where we need to be really for a city our size and we're going to continue to grow. Um, so operational, yes, we don't have the money in the general fund to, uh, to start operating those tomorrow. Our hope is that we would have the money to construct the facilities at some point down the road in the next 10 years. Um, so this is really, really a future plan uh, to be prepared to do that. Um, we're not saying, now we need to buy the fire trucks right away. Um, that needs to be first. Um, they are, they are, they're failing uh, us as we speak and they're at the end of their lifespan. So we do need to replace those right away. We do not have to do a fire station right away. Um, and so, so that, that's part of the planning process of this 10 year, 10 year look. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Chief. Could I just have a quick follow up, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not proposing to buy any fire equipment for those potential new stations at this time through this, through the equipment part of the bond, or are you? We are, we are potentially going to, what we're going to do is we're going to buy the fleet because we get one shot at that every 15 years. We're going to buy a fleet that we believe will make us uh, a bit, uh, have our ability to reach the next 15 year mark. Um, so for, as an example, two fleets ago, we had uh, 11 fire engines. We have uh, 14 now. Um, we will likely buy 17 engines for the next fleet because we're running more calls. We're putting more miles on them. That would give us the ability if, if, you know, we decided, hey, we're going to build station 12, for example, or we're going to move station eight. Uh, and we had the revenue to be able to, to staff that station. We would already have the equipment to do it. It's not going to hurt us to have a few spare uh, fire engines uh, in the fleet. So that's that's our intention. And that 26 million already includes that that amount. Thank you. OK, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, I think it's 14 million that we have set aside for fire stations. 
So that gets us the land and the building at two different locations. Okay. Yes. And then also, uh, this might be a question for Kristen. Um, are any of these proposed uh, sites for these new fire stations, are they in any urban renewal districts? I know Portland Road has some kind of revitalization systems going right now. And could those funds be used to help support this project? Uh, they could not. There was state legislation passed a couple of sessions ago that precludes uh, urban renewal funds being used for public buildings unless it was already in a plan or unless you get the voted concurrence of your other taxing districts. So I guess I guess the answer could be a maybe if the school district and the county would vote to approval to use urban renewal funds for these facilities. Follow yep. up if I may. Um, so I guess what are the chances of that happening? Um, uh, right or quite quite <laughs> slim. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We always when we cite when we cite fire stations, we always look to see if there is city owned land that's close to where we need to cite the station to best serve the community. And if there is a perfect example of that, is Station Eleven. Um, there were several sites in West Salem where we could cite the station. This was city-owned property. It's, it met the needs. And so uh, Public Works owned the property. And so we were able to, to get cite the fire station there on two acres uh, without the cost uh, of purchasing the land. The city already owned it. So we always do look at that uh, when we're looking at uh, areas to cite a fire station. Uh, you know, another example is Station 5. We had to buy three residential homes to, to recite that one where it was at because it was, we really didn't need to move that one. So we had to, we had to do a little bit of eminent domain there in that area. So it just really depends on what properties are available for where we need to cite. Uh, Chief, last, uh, last meeting, uh, uh, City City Manager Rutherford asked you about the airport and its fire station as well as its equipment. Are we buying equipment, uh, that kind of specialized equipment that's needed out at the airport? Uh, and uh, sort of a what if we don't ever have a need for it? Uh, we don't have commercial service, you know, that kind of thing. Where, where are we in that? And I know it's really ambiguous. I understand that. I'd just like to hear you hear you see if you can cut through the fog just a touch. Sure. So remember, we still have a lot of private corporate jets that fly in and out. We have military, military uh, aviation going out there with helicopters, um, a lot of private pilots. So it's a fairly busy airport, uh, even though we don't have uh, passengers flying in and out. So the need to have the airport rescue firefighting equipment is, is still there. It's just on okay. the FAA requirement for smaller, smaller airports. Uh, once we get passenger service, we have to do standby and, and then we're under the FAA regulations for, you know, being able to respond. We have included in the 26 million, a new ARF a type vehicle for the airport. Um, our current frontline vehicle is over 10 years old and they basically told us it's, it doesn't count um, as far as the FAA is concerned. So um, we have planned to replace that vehicle. Uh, I will also tell you that we have used those vehicles for gasoline tanker fires on the freeway, um, okay. large fires where we need a water supply or foam. Um, we had a, we had a, uh, uh, a di big diesel fire over at uh, near behind the shops at one point we used a, one of our ARF trucks for that so they have other purposes but really their focus really is the airport and protecting the airport and uh, the passengers and the pilots in the planes so either way whether we have commercial or we continue to have the level of general aviation that we currently enjoy we need to replace that equipment we need to keep that at a certain level in order to maintain uh, FAA certification, whatever that looks like on a, on this. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. That's the sort of the fire station and, and a little bit on equipment, but do, do you want to go a little deeper into equipment? Yeah, Chris. Uh, I actually want to still stand fire stations for one more question. And that's just, oh, yeah. you look at city inventory of property available in the areas that you're looking at for potential future stations. 
And is there any property that we already own that might be utilized or, or maybe owned by other governments or something where we may be able to work something out? Is there, are there co-location options out in those areas, that kind of thing? So, uh, and I haven't done this recently uh, because properties change and properties get sold, bought, and even the city sells properties at times. Um, when we, the last I looked, there were some city properties out along Portland Road that may work. They weren't as, they weren't as advantageous as some that we would have to buy for response times. And really what we're trying to build is a network so we can best respond to, to all the calls. Um, there was a piece of property uh, in the Southeast uh, on the Mill Creek area that was potentially uh, gonna be owned by the city, but they didn't buy it. Um, so that was a piece of property that we're, we're looking at somebody else bought it. Um, and so I'm not aware of any at this point, certainly any time we would cite a fire station, we would dig back into wherever we're looking to see and look who the owners of those properties are and try to leverage uh, either, you know, co-location. Um, we did that at station 10 with the, with the state, um, the state corrections uh, warehouses out there. We bought a small sliver of property from them. Um, it was a good, you know, win-win, if you will. Um, piece of property they really weren't using um, and, it, and it fit where we needed to be. So we always really try to capitalize on anytime we can find efficiencies or we will, we will do that. Well, as we're trying to maximize projects under this bond, it would be really helpful to us if you could do some of that work now rather than later so we could free up potentially money for something else if we didn't need to reserve it for land purchase. Uh, we certainly can take a look again. Um, like I said, with not knowing when I'm gonna build the station, what I find today might change in two weeks, might change in two months. Um, I'm sure it's changed since the last time I looked, but we certainly can take a look at, at the, the general areas where we're, where we're thinking about locating these stations to see what properties, um, there may be some opportunities for us to, to take advantage of. We have done that in the past. And like I said, there were some, um, the market changes all the time. So, but we'd have to do that. Uh, it's a little difficult to know. Like I said, if I, if I don't know I'm building a station until 2027, what I look at now probably is, unless you buy the property in advance, uh, that, that, that could be an option too. You could, you could purchase the property and then just sit on it. We can well, certainly do that. No, so we, do me a favor we look, at your, look at your colleagues in the eyes as we're cutting their project list here in a few minutes because we're reserving money that we may not need for one of your projects. So I'm just trying to maximize this opportunity. Maybe we don't need to purchase property. Help, you know, I'm just trying to get to the house out here. Counselor, I hear that. And we can go back and look at what we have that's under city ownership or what we have that may be under DAS or county ownership to see if there may be opportunities there. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Yeah, Counselor Stapleton. Thank Counselor you. Hoy, will you take this over for a minute? Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is maybe an odd one. Um, you know, when we looked at the library, we tried to find creative solutions to getting the library with housing. Um, are there other cities that are doing creative things with things like fire stations, you know, whether they're on the edge of a, of a park, right? And the park is kind of taking up the background, but it's city owned land that then uh, we kind of carve off a little bit for a fire station. Um, and I highly doubt that there's any fire stations with housing <laughs> that would be noisy. Um, but we're, we're moving into new and uh, really uncharted uh, territory with the growth and the restricted use of land that we have around us as a city. So I'm just wondering if there's been any research to those types of um, maybe not real standard ways of, of go moving forward with projects like these. So I'll, I'll go back to the example I used before Station 11 in West Salem. Um, that was a property that is, was purchased by the city for a 20 million gallon a water reservoir, a future reservoir. The reservoir has not been installed, so it was 12 acres. Um, we, we approached them and said, hey, this, is a, this would be a good location for a fire station. Um, make some modifications to the, to the, the property, the entrance. It was kind of a, a, a swallow in the ground that we had to put a, quite a bit of fill dirt in. But we were able to site a fire station there. Uh, and it's, it met the service needs. So really, what, when we look at siting a fire station, we look at one, what, what service area do we need to serve and what location best serves that area. So we have some computer modeling that we do. Um, we can take historical call volume and we can say, okay, where, 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 where would the pin drop for the best location? 
Um, and usually we get three or four pins and then we look to see what's nearby. And then again, we, we look at what, what the city owns. Um, we look at the neighborhood because there's some impacts with, you know, we try to be good neighbors, but there are some noise associated with us. Um, you know, diesel trucks have smell like diesel trucks. Um, so, you know, there's, there's also positives, you know, the fire station is close to your house. So if you need a paramedic, they're going to be right around the corner. So we try to balance all of those things. And um, there is no, I would tell you, there's no right or wrong answer as far as how creative we can be. Um, I, I would be hesitant to say that a library fire station would be a good combination um, just because of the noise and the, the smell and, and the traffic in and out of the station. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, we wouldn't buy a property and build two things on, on a property if it was, if it was, if there was a value in that, uh, an economy in that, I guess. Great. And just a follow up out of the 7 million per location, um, how much of that are you setting aside for land acquisition versus the building itself? So we, um, we did some, we had uh, Alan Dan and do a little bit of research for us when we initially started talking about a bond issue in 2020. And so we went out and we said, okay, we know that, that, uh, that in 2007, we built fire stations. We used the same footprint. Uh, it's about a 10,000 square foot building, about uh, 6,000 of that to the Bay Area, the big Bay Area for the trucks and the rest is living quarters. And we designed them so that two companies could operate out of them. So they're designed for future growth in those areas. If we need to add an engine company in West Salem, we may just add one at station 11 or station five. They're built that way. Um, we built those stations for two and a half million dollars in 2007. So we built four of them for 10 million. Um, unfortunately, as you're aware that the market has changed significantly since then and our costs have doubled. Um, so the last estimate we got back from our architects and from Alan was they were going to be around five and a half million dollars for the building, maybe as much as six. And so we would we then we carved out about a million dollars or a million and a half for for property acquisition again we would look at that and say, if we can find a property that meets our needs and meets the location needs of the station and it's city owned already, we would take advantage of that. And that's exactly what we did at station 11. Okay, and sorry for another follow-up here, but if we do find land that we don't need to buy, then we have about $3 million that would be extra in this pot. Could that then, it, say it, it all gets approved and we get the votes and we have this, we don't need to buy land for either of these. Can that three million shift in the slice of pie that it's in, or does it have to stay with fire? No, it, it could. It could. You could move that money. Um, I would say it's probably more like two million uh, sure. than three million uh, because our, our our construction costs continue to go up, uh, materials go up, uh, so it may cost six million to build each each fire station, but. If we got the land and didn't have to pay for the land, then we wouldn't have a need for that money. Okay, so that could shift then to, to parks or to transportation where we have lots and lots of project lists that are gonna be hard to cut. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that's, I wanna follow up on that because I think that may be one of the things that is, we wanna make sure everybody understands it on our committee, but anyone that's watching this, how flexible these funds are if they aren't spent on and how, or prices change or all the other things that can happen. And Josh or Peter or somebody, can you take us through that? I mean, we've, we are still spending, I think, or we may be just barely done with spending our last bond for streets at this point. So uh, we've had a lot of flexibility in there for various projects. I'm not sure who can who can reassure us and, and the public that this money will be available for, you know, and a council's change uh, and their priorities change and the community's priorities change over time. And uh, though they we're not locking funds down here at all, if I understand it correctly. Mr. Mayor, it all goes back to the ballot language. Uh, so yeah. if you include project descriptions in the ballot language, those are the projects we do. Um, what I would recommend is we include uh, language in there where if there's savings from projects, we can use it at the direction of the council steering committee. If there's savings, it can be shifted uh, to a different category where maybe something came in higher than anticipated. 
Um, so if there's savings, if there's premium, as we get interest earnings on the bond, right. uh, we can allocate those toward projects that didn't get included initially. We can go below the line and grab projects, uh, you know, just like with the streets and bridges bond. Yeah, if, if, I, if I could add to that, uh, Mayor. So uh, we did a lot of extra projects with the 2008 bond measure because we, we hit it at a time when uh, the financial crisis was in place. So prices dropped dramatically. So we had a lot of savings. So, so what I want to make sure that, uh, that the committee is clear and the community is clear is any project that's listed in the bond we're going to build. We have to build. Uh, yeah. It's only when there are savings or, or something else that, that then we can do extras. For something like a property acquisition, if we want to be more general, like the discussion that you were just having, hey, there's, there's X number of million dollars for a fire station, parks, you know, libraries, and then if, if it's a little fungible in terms, then we can be fungible with those monies. But but we would have to acquire the properties first if we uh, if we say it in the bond that we were going to acquire properties. And then only if there were savings could they then be used for something else. Well, are we being too specific saying, you know, library, housing, uh, but not but not including fire stations, we include that separately. Should we be doing a section that really is a land acquisition section aimed at the, the several kinds of land acquisition we're talking about? So we can kind of move the money around real easily as, as uh, time passes and we get a better feel for uh, what's how, you know, the configuration, what's needed, that whole Section, yeah. I'm just not clear on that. How, how tied down are we in what we're doing right now? Yeah, I think you certainly could. I mean, I think Councilor Stapleton mentioned it earlier, uh, this idea of, of buying a big property so that we can have a park right. and a fire station, for example, I think is a great idea. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not too opposed to a park, fire station, and library. Maybe we can put them <laughs> at either end of the big property. So uh, so I think leaving it, uh, you know, open, you know, you know, Dan's on the call, so so he can he can probably he may be able to advise us a little more. But I don't uh, I don't think that's a bad idea. Well, should it be a separate category, Dan, of land acquisition as we pull this stuff out and put it into an aggregate, you know, a a broader definition or what? What's the best way to go, Mr. Mayor Dan Atchison, City Attorney? So I, th I think as you saw with the the streets and bridges bond, we 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 covered all the named projects first and then the yeah. bond measure had a catch-all for other improvements and whatnot. And so with all the savings, we were able to get to that catch-all. I think here, you know, we, it'll, it'll be incumbent upon us to word it correctly and talk about, you know, for fire stations in particular, it would be the uh, acquisition of land and, you know, construction of fire stations. And if we're able to get the land for free through some other mechanism, you could still use the bond funds for the construction, but we wouldn't be obligated to acquire land. Okay. I'm not sure I understood that. Well, if you have a, a Is line that a item flexible on, system then, do you think, or? I'm sorry, repeat yourself, please. Well, we're talking about land. We're talking about uh, uh, affordable housing, library branches, uh, new uh, new fire stations or moved fire stations, all involving, I assume, at some point, land acquisition. Should we be looking at a land acquisition amount rather than categorically uh, isolating these pieces? I'm just maybe not. Maybe that's just a really bad idea. I don't there's, know. There's no, Mayor, no bad idea. I think, no Mayor, bad I ideas. Think <laughs> to clarify, instead of having Trust a line me. item that's the, the library and affordable housing, you would just have land acquisition, parentheses, fire stations, parks, libraries, affordable housing under one much bigger number. Is that is that what you're thinking? I'm, ju I'm just asking. No. I, I'm just not sure it's a good idea. And I'm kind of waiting still for Niblock's here to catch fire. Uh, but I think, cool. Mr. Mayor, the, probably the, the, the right approach is, I mean, we understand the, the council and, and probably the electorate wants as much flexibility as possible to get as many, many of these projects paid for as possible. 
Yeah. So, you know, the, I don't have a, a straight answer for you right now on how okay. that should be worded, but I think obviously that's something we'll look into with that in mind. Okay. I, I think that's kind of part, a big part of what uh, Councillor Stapleton was talking about is, geez, if you can get, you know, an extra couple acres, throw the library on it as well. There seems to be a, a possibility we do better in terms of using those funds. I think that makes sense to me. So, okay. Well, what do you want to do next? Uh, oh, fire equipment. Niblock, are you there still? Yes, sir. Chief, how much of this, uh, and I'm not, I don't know how to ask you to quantify this, okay, but I think you do with your maps and things, but how much of this is just plain life safety for our community? I'm, I'm very concerned that this life safety issue is going to get mixed up in, in all kinds of land acquisition, bike paths, parking lots, all that kind of stuff. And this is really at the heart of what we do is make sure our people aren't dying of heart attacks because we haven't done, we haven't provided the correct equipment or the an adequate service. Where, where are we on that continuum? So everything uh, starts with us being able to get there in a timely fashion. And so if our equipment is, is failing and, and starting to break down and it's not, not reliable, won't start every time, um, that really puts a kink in our ability to get to you quickly. Yeah. Um, and so it all starts with a reliable fleet and, you know, th this community has, has always supported uh, a good fleet for the fire department. And, and we, we have run our fleet uh, long each time, 18 years last time, where it, we're approaching 16 years for this fleet. Uh, and we put a lot more miles on them. So um, in order to maintain what we're doing now, and we're not meeting the standard now, but to maintain what we're doing now, um, you know, if you were to give it a grade, we're, we're doing a, about D work. Uh, we're, we're at 61% of the time getting to somebody when they need to be gotten to to help help them through their emergency. Um, a lot of that is location and some of that is a, a failing fleet. And uh, we're just we're on the cusp of really starting to have some issues with transmissions and motors and, and those types of things. And so uh, this really is at the heart of of how we deliver our service. So without without a good fleet, uh, we began to crumble even more than we are now. So it, it really is important that we have uh, a fleet that starts first time every time, goes into pump gear the first time every time, delivers the things that people expect when we show up at their house uh, to save their life or their property. You know, the, the thing that, and, and just share with the committee, the thing that concerns me a great deal, and I uh, is that is mixing life safety with, boy, I'd sure like to have that kind of stuff and trying to take that out as a bond measure. Uh, I, I, I'm beginning to really worry that we shouldn't be looking seriously, depending on how this all plays out, looking seriously at putting the fire bond out separately. Have two bond measures, they total the the 300 million, but uh, that uh, we don't jeopardize life safety in another kind of bond measure that may have other values in, in place other than life safety. That'd be my only, just, it just you know, kind of just thinking out loud about it. I'm just concerned about it. Yeah, Virginia. Thank you. Um... I will definitely need to think about what you just said, but what I what I wanted to say um, was that um, I I don't have an issue right now with the amount of money that we have set aside for fire equipment. I am not an expert at all in fire equipment um, and knowing what we need and how it is used. Um, and I do trust the chief with that information um, and that he's getting us the most accurate, up to date information that we need. I, of course, am always going to be pushing for things um, that are going to be more um, environmentally friendly and, and all of those things. And I know that the chief is also there 
Um, and I know that the fire department as a whole is supportive of that. Um, but I also understand that the technology is not there yet. And if we buy a fleet today and it lasts for 15 years, uh, we're still within our hopeful um, goals of meeting our um, em emissions reduction with the next time that we buy fire trucks. And so as we work towards that, um, my hope is that the next time that we buy fire engines, that the technology has caught up, that we can make those decisions um, that are gonna be more helpful for us as a whole, uh, meet our climate goals. Um, but I personally don't have any concerns with the number that the chief has put forward with the equipment list. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Councilor Barney. Thank you. Um, my question has to deal with the purchase. I don't have any problems with expending the, the funds uh, as they've been laid out either. My question is more in buying the whole fleet at once. I know Chief Novlock, you mentioned that it's better to have all the trucks the same so everybody's used to it. But wow, we have been seeing such advances in technology every five years when it comes to vehicles, it seems. And I'm just wondering if there's any way to kind of phase it in to take advantage of uh, better, better mileage, better, you know, all, all the things that keep getting implemented. Um, um, and if you were to do that, I mean, are all the current fire trucks, do they all have roughly the same number of miles on them? Do you rotate them to try to keep them all the same? Um, so those, those are just a couple of my questions, if you could speak to it. Absolutely. Um, you're right. When you, when you buy a point in time and you buy your fleet, you get the technology that's available at that point in time. And, and then you wait 15 years before you get the next group of technology that comes along. Um, changes in fire apparatus happen fairly slowly. Um, the last fleet we bought, we, we, we had a mind to, you know, the environment as much as possible. So they're all EPA compliant with pollution and the scrubbers for the, the, uh, the diesel engines to reduce emissions and reduce the chemicals they put out in the, in the ozone, um, LED lighting, those types of things. Um, and we do rotate the fleet. So we have 14 fire engines. We spread the mileage out across all 14 engines. So we actually did a calculation when we bought this fleet. We anticipated that they would last 14 years. Um, our goal was to replace them in 2020. That didn't happen, so we're past that. But um, our goal was to replace them in 2020. We bought enough engines so we could spread the, the mileage out across the fleet so that by the 14th year, they would all have about the same mileage and we'd be able to make it through without having any major issues and we did up to 2020. Um, we're past that now so we're starting to see the transmission and the motors and um, one of our ladder trucks has had a full engine, brand new engine put in it and the other ladder truck is getting ready to need its brand new engine put in it. That's a $50,000 expense and it's down and out of service for you know about two months to get that done. Um, so you know some of the advantages for us is like I said before is everybody is trained on the same truck they're all identical I can move person from one station to other and it's not I don't have to retrain them on a new vehicle middle of the night three o'clock in the morning do you remember which lever to pull to put the truck and pump gear they're all the same um, so there is some advantage and there's some disadvantages uh, we find that replacing the fleet all at once I've done it both ways in another department, I bought them onesie twosie and uh, you end up with uh, a mix mash of parts and parts availability and even model, even the same model, Chevrolet to Chevrolet, a couple of years apart, there are some differences in the parts they use. And so then your parts mechanics end up having to stock more parts and those types of things. So it's been an advantage for us. Uh, a lot of a lot of large cities do this. Not every city does this. Um, so it really depends on on the the, the city and and how they they plan their their apparatus out. Um, we have found this to be successful for us and uh, operate pretty efficiently for us the way we're doing it now. That doesn't mean there's not a different way to do it though. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd like to just also add to uh, Chief Limbaugh's response. Um, I think there would also be a concern given our timing and our strategy with bonds and trying to keep that level, you know, over the bond period, that if we didn't get the necessary equipment through this bond measure and we get five years down the road and try to spread it out over time, 
we wouldn't have the resources. And if we had to go back out for another bond, then it would be above and beyond it when it would be an increase in what's on the tax bill. Uh, so, I mean, that, that is a strategy that could be pursued, but it has been our strategy in the past to try to keep those tax bills stable and just increasing at that 3% level. Okay. So, I okay. Think I just had Mr. a quick clear, uh, When would we be purchasing these fire engines? I, I would like to buy them yesterday, uh, but that's not an option. <laughs> um, as soon as possible, my, my understanding from, from Josh is that uh, we would, there would be a period of time if we pass the bond in November, or, or I should say when we pass the bond in November, um, there would be a period of time before we'd actually have the dollars to be able to, to invest. So it's 10, 12 months before we'd actually maybe see the revenue to be able to purchase them. Uh, and so if we bought them uh, November of 23, we would see those trucks in, in service probably in December of 24, um, which puts this fleet, you know, well past its, its sell by date. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why we were, we're buying an extra engine and a ladder right now. So we can stretch that out a little bit and try to try to make that finish line. Um, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the projected timeline for us to get them them in service. Just, okay, just to real quick clarify, uh, so if the bond passes in November, we could turn around pretty rapidly and issue those bonds the following spring. Uh, so we, we could have the funds uh, definitely within this next fiscal year. So before July of 2023. Um, yeah. just, just to add on to that, our, <laughs> is the purchase of fire engine, engines experiencing the same issues with supply availability that uh, we're seeing with everything else? Yes, we uh, typically, if you were to order an engine, you'd see about a six month delivery pre uh, post or pre pandemic. Um, right now, um, they're anywhere from 12 to 18 months, depending on the manufacturer. We've just placed a, an order for the lease apparatus that we're buying, the, uh, the ladder truck and the engine. And we are being told now it will be earliest, it will be as December of this year. So that's a little less than 12 months. So that's pretty good. We're, we're excited about that. Um, in a real world, it would be six months delivery. Okay. Thanks. Any further thoughts on this? What's your pleasure? You want to move it up as one of the yellow items in Toto and I'm ready to move it forward. Okay, any, any objections to that? Okay, well then we will move it up with the others. I'm still gonna, uh, I think at some point, I hope we can do an evaluation, a, a cold hearted political evaluation, whether or not we're trying to use fire equipment to carry the rest of the bond measure. I wanna make sure that this fire equipment problem at least is discussed to make sure that we and the public understand uh, the, life, the life safety implications of, uh, of bond failure. I, I think we just have to be realistic about what, what, this, what the potential for this measure is. So uh, I just hope everybody's ready to at least talk about, not do it, just talk about cutting them loose if, if we need to, to let the fire services uh, and uh, the emergency services uh, survive. This, this is a new bond strategy. It's a new approach. It's tying a lot of things together that are unrelated uh, and have different levels of public need. So, okay, so we'll move it up to the yellow. Now we're down to parks. No, we did parks and parking lots, or did we? Nope, we didn't. Okay. Let's do parks and parking lots. Get that one. Is that, would that be the appropriate one next? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think that works. Okay. All right. Well, what's your thoughts? 
I have a couple questions. Yeah, you know, please okay. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're okay. Um, just a couple questions. I've heard it mentioned that at the Orchard Heights Park, there is a dog park. Could you explain? It's listed on in a priority one um, as new dog parks or fencing for dog parks. My question is, what is the upgrade there? Um, and I would love for this committee to consider adding a dog park um, in North Salem, because right now it looks like we would have um, We'd have Mental Brown, which is great, kind of the center of attention right now for dogs. We'd have West Salem, uh, one out in Fairview, um, and then it looks like Gear Park, um, which I consider pretty central. Um, so I'm hoping to see if we can add a, a dog park to the north uh, in, in a park up there. So one, could you explain what's going on at Orchard, Orchard Heights uh, Park with their dog park? And, and two, maybe we can talk about a dog park in North Salem. Jennifer, if you're still there, can you explain the dog part at Orchard Heights? So the dog part at Orchard Heights is just an unleashed area. So this project would actually create a dog park with fencing and, and uh, um, uh, pathways to the dog park, all of that. But right now it's just an unleashed, for, uh, uh, unleashed dog park area. Okay, great. And then, so that's kind of what we have at Mental Brown right now, correct? Right. Yes. Right. So then we would be adding fencing to the Mento Brown one or no? No. No. Okay. Um, could we talk about um, maybe as a committee or with staff, um, the idea about adding a dog park in North Salem, you know, during the pandemic, this is probably one of the, the most talked about increase, right? Everybody getting dogs, um, making sure that the folks in North Salem have a place that they can go that's fenced um, would be a high priority for me personally. Um, so I'd love to talk about that with the committee. I'm all for it. I think that this is the one the one area where Kaiser actually um, supplements us a little bit. I think a lot of my neighbors go to the dog park in Kaiser, uh, live out in my area because it's about the closest one we have. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I've been advocating, you can ask Mr. Romanek, I am pretty much a broken record to him. I advocate dog parks all the time. I was super excited to get the one in Gear Park. I would love to have one somewhere out in North Northeast. Have you got a park in mind, Virginia? You know, I talked to Rob about this last week. I don't know if he's on the call. And he did say that staff had um, already considered that for an, you know, a few different parks that was something that could fit into um, parks that are in North, uh, North Salem, but he did not have a name for one uh, per se. And of course I would leave that up for staff to kind of figure that out. Thank you, Virginia. This is Jose. Um, I'm also supportive of this idea. You know, most of the um, older homes in that, in that neighborhood, you know, have large yards, but a lot of apartment complexes have recently been built. Um, Built with no amenities, just pretty much apartment complexes and parking lots. You know, um, there is no place to take your puppies unless you go on school property. Hawthorne Park, on the corner of Hawthorne and Silverton, is where I see people take their dog because it's just a large open space. I, I don't know if it was maybe used in the past for a baseball field, but it's just not used for that anymore. But that one on the corner of Hawthorne and Silverton is, uh, would be an ideal location. Yeah. Great, I did have some other questions. Um, and that was about um, the, we have about 1.8 million in uh, the, the proposed priority one budget for Bush's Pasture Park. Um, and one of them would be for the new bathroom repairs on the top section, and then also uh, for a shelter. And I know that these are part of the master plan for that location. Um, but my question is for staff, um, I guess maybe their reasoning for that. Um, you know, this is a park, a beautiful park that has a lot of amenities already. Um, so maybe we could talk about that. And, and does it get any other funding for its historical status, um, for any kind of tip funding from the travel 
uh, part of things. Um, just questions about how that's funded. And I know, um, I believe that Riverfront Park also gets those type of funding as well, those, those extra dollars that aren't really accessible to other parks. Councilor Stapleton, Rob is not available today, so he is out of town. Uh, if uh, uh, Jennifer has any thoughts on those two, I'd, I'd appreciate her comments. Otherwise, we'd need Rob to get back to answer some of those questions. So the restroom uh, uh, that we're looking at rehabilitating is an extremely old restroom. It's the one at the top of the Derby track at Bush's Pasture Park. Um, it's failing. We've had to repair the roof, the, um, the items in the restroom uh, itself. Uh, we're continually having to replace and repair the structure itself is in very poor condition. So that's why we're needing a complete rehab of that. It's just getting beyond the point of where we can kind of stick a Band-Aid on it and keep trying to fix it. It's a highly used restroom. Um, everything from when we have the, you know, the art fair there each year to, uh, you know, folks who attend, you know, football games or the reservable areas. So um, that's the reason for the restroom. The shelter uh, is over... Uh, on kind of the east-ish part of the park, kind of over by Phillips Field, uh, the baseball fields there. Um, there's a lot of demand for folks who want to picnic and reserve a, a spot over there. We don't currently have a shelter there. Um, they just kind of, uh, you know, uh, use that area to, to uh, I guess, to, to have their uh, uh picnic or whatever they want to do there. Um, so this would give us an opportunity to be putting a shelter in there to actually reserve that area and additional uh, source of revenue um, coming into the park um, because there's there's been requested demand for that um, at that particular park. Um, with regard to P Bush Park is a taught uh, eligible park, uh, the same as Riverfront. I think that's what you're referencing, uh, referring to Councilor Stapleton. Uh, you know, but even with taught funds, you have to have funds available to move those projects forward. Um, and, and Josh certainly can address this in more detail. Uh, you know, with COVID and all of that, uh, there's not a lot of additional uh, funds available. So a lot of the taught projects have not been able to move forward uh, that are on the CIP list just because there's just not a lot of, of additional funds um, uh, for spending on projects just because of the decline um, in the tur tourism during the COVID period. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the that's kind of the situation where we're at with regard to taught. But 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 Josh can certainly uh, address that in more detail. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, the uh, transient occupancy tax fund, uh, we are seeing a pretty significant recovery at the moment. Um, but as far as projects that are kind of lined up for that funding, uh, it's similar to what we're looking at here. I mean, there's a lot of demand for those projects. Uh, so, so it could be this, this type of project would be on the list. Um, I'm not sure where it would fall into the prioritization. Um, but again, there's lots of projects that are vying for those dollars. Can you tell me, um, is it just Riverfront and Bush, Bush's Pasture Park that are qualify? Are those the parks that qualify for those top funds or are there more? Uh, I'm going to get back to you just so I don't I don't miss speak or Peter might know off the top of his head. I think those are the two parks that we get uh, taught operating money for. We have gotten taught money for um, electrical equipment replacement and soft uh, 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 tennis court improvements and any number of other things where where there's a, uh, a connection between the facility and bringing in uh, activities that will bring in visitors uh, throughout the park system. Okay. Does Wallace Marine qualify? Uh, I don't think we get, I mean, it's not a qualification thing. I think it's just been a the uh, project has to fit the definition. Right. There's, there's sort of the, these, those two parks uh, bring in, uh, you know, people bring in tourist dollars. So, so then any other project has to sort of uh, combine with that. Jen, do you have additional info? So Wallace is a Todd eligible park. Um, it's similar though, and as Josh, Josh indicated, um, you know, it's buying for those same limited dollars, but, but Wallace is a Todd eligible park as well. 
Yeah, my recollection also is uh, City Hall uh, has been Todd eligible. We've used top funds here in the past years, uh, maintaining the some of the park-like aspects of City Hall. Uh, what what has been, I think, probably as you look at top funds, don't forget that as a city council. Uh, it's approved a 35, I think it's 35%. It's a fairly substantial allocation to travel Salem. It's, it's been going really to the, to the travel industry types uh, as opposed to going into the parks. It is not, and it has really decreased the amount of park funding available, although it's increased the amount of overall funding. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a really kind of a, an interesting uh, discussion. I really recommend during the budget process, pay really close attention to TOT and what's going on inside the fund and how it's being used and where it's coming from, just as a, as a thought. I know uh, there's a, some interest now in using TOT funds for the airport, uh, you know, things like that, that just keep, it's, it's an interesting place to try to find money. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you. you. No, yeah. it's okay. If you if you don't mind, I'd I'd love to I guess finish my thought on that. Um, I guess for me, you know, uh, Councilor Gonzalez brought up a need that he has in his ward for um, a park that is underdeveloped uh, there, but has really large groups of uh, folks that are meeting there. Sorry, my cat is joining the meeting. Can you say hi? Um, which, which park? Um, Jose, could you remind me what park you were talking about? Yeah, Northgate Park. Northgate. Northgate, okay. Yeah, and so my question was, you know, if we have um, additional funding sources for folks um, or for parks that are like uh, Bush's Pasture Park or the Riverfront, then I'm not sure um, if maybe we should be looking to spend bond money um, there as well. Maybe we could spend the bond money on parks that don't have that extra source of income or... Um, uh, yeah, just a different source of funding for their projects. Uh, this shelter and bathroom would probably be amazing at the park that um, Jose was uh, rooting for on his in his ward. Um, and the last thing I'd love to talk about um, is is parking lots. Um, I am okay funding the Minto Brown uh, number two and number three as priority one, but I really would like to see the rest of those parking lots move. Uh, down to uh, either priority two or three, just to allow for more funding for these different parks in our neighborhoods, um, help hope, hopefully get those different functions of a park. And I know that the that parking lots are part of that, but um, just more of the uh, of the of the different sports fields and things like that that we have on the list. Yeah, Councillor Hoy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And I guess I'll just reiterate what I've said before and kind of underscore what Councillor Stapleton just mentioned. Some of the enhancements that at places like Bush's Pasture Park, when it's an enhancement, that's already an amazing park with so many different things that are available to residents. I would love to see some of our other parks that we're looking to enhance that don't really have anything or not much at all, that we sort of bring them up a little bit before we start really enhancing the places that are already uh, overflowing with amenities. So that would be my my thought there. Like on the, I'm fine with repairing the bathroom at Bush's Pasture Park and replacing that as needed. But in terms of a new shelter, I would prefer to put a shelter at another park that doesn't have a shelter at all, uh, rather than putting another one at Bush's Pasture. That would just be my prioritization. And so I, not that we shouldn't do it, but I would just move it down on the list. Um, also, I agree. I think that those two parking lots at Minto Brown need to be Hot, they need to be in priority number one, but I, you know, I still look at that parking lot that we keep seeing pictures of over at Orchard Heights, and I would love to have that parking lot in one of my parks that that's undeveloped so far uh, over in my area of town. We'd be thrilled to have the gator skin or whatever they call that type of pavement. Uh, we'd be happy to have it at a functional park. So um, I would move those up, those parking lots down to uh, number two. Would it be... Uh... Of interest to to look at again a a less specific uh, park allocation from the bond that it include a series of parking lots, uh, dog parks, uh, shelters. You know, sort of 
leave it somewhat a little less specific and uh, allow council over the next few years to allocate that out through the CIP process or whatever other processes is used? If, if that's a possibility in terms of from the city attorney's perspective, I definitely think that that's a, a good idea. I like the idea of buckets. So it's our intention to put this much money in say shelters and this much money in parking lots and in, in parks specifically. And then as time goes on and we can, we can make those priority decisions as needs arise. Um, I, I like that approach better. I mean, right now, frankly, deciding, okay, do we put a shelter at Bush's pasture? Or do we put it at, at yeah. Uh, uh, you know, another, uh, say Wallace Marine. I mean, should we be making those decisions right now when really that money is, pro we're probably looking at, I'm guessing five to seven years down the road from today. You know, I'm, it's kind of hard to make that prioritization right now uh, when we're not doing it in somewhat real time. Yeah, I, I just, if, if, if it's possible to look at it that way, I think that would be uh, that would allow us to move through this without trying to kind of mi make some long term micro decisions that we may not want to have to make in the next couple of weeks. Yes. And, and whoever Don or Courtney or Dan or Courtney, excuse me, Don. Um, well, if, if I might, um, one of the tensions is being specific enough to encourage voters to see a benefit um, as yeah. they're considering whether or not to approve a measure. And yeah. so, so they're, they're um, you know, Mayor Bennett, you referred earlier to sort of that political lens about how to approach this moving forward. And, and I'd like to invite back um, our pollster and our um, uh, other professionals who have done this quite a bit in other communities, invite them back to our next conversation just as the package is being developed, get their insight about which and when and how kind of to, to help us um, make a good balance that could be successful in a future election. So, so to your point, um, it, it's hard to know exactly what the right balance right. is for specificity and, and future flexibility. I, I hear what you're saying. And I, let, me, let me just try this out. Our, you'd share it with the pollster, the concern that I have and I suspect other counselors would too, that often in that type of analysis, political analysis, areas like South Salem, Bush's Pasture, West Salem, all that does very well because you know what? Everybody votes in those wards and you come up to the North End and voter turnout is quite a bit lower and it tends to result in kind of a, uh, a shifting, you need the stuff up there, but you're not going to get the votes up there if you put it into the, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm nervous about that kind of analysis uh, when it's applied to trying to keep this ward by ward aiming for, you know, success because just because of the way our, our demographics work in this town, our voting, particularly our yes. voting demographics work. Yes, um, understood. And, and also okay. trying to balance some of the community and council priorities for equity yeah. and inclusion. And, and it, so there's quite a lot yeah. at work at play and, and how to, um, your input is influencing how best to develop the bond and then we'll run it with a little bit more of, of that political lens when we next gather. Okay, well, how do we get this, how do we get our equity stuff into the uh, political lens, uh, into the process for the political lens? What's the best way to get it there? Uh, you know, the, the, the really high-end equity occurs when it's kind of a council or really a council decision because you have such a more balanced representation of the areas of the community by having counselors by ward rather than by voting block, you know? I, so I kind of like to have you think about that a little bit uh, just to make sure that we have room for equity before, if particularly if we go into a, a serious, how are we gonna pass this thing with, uh, 
meeting both challenges. I, I agree with you. It, it is a challenge. Yeah, Virginia. Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Mayor, for bringing that up. I think you bring up a really, this is a hard part of the conversation, but it needs to be had um, because part of me really wants all the details in there to ensure that the areas of town that are underserved um, get what they need, uh, the investment that they need. But I also do understand uh, the comments that you made about who votes. And that's important because we need to get this across the finish line. So I just thank you for bringing up the, the hard part saying the hard part out loud. I think that's what they say, um, because I think that's something that we as a council need to really wrestle with as we move forward. Yeah, and we can. I think we really can kind of talk that through and see if buckets is a better way to approach equity because you leave it in the hands of a more equitable distributing system, which might be the city council, you know. But our, how many votes can we lose at Bush Park because the toilets still work? You know, it's, it's weird. It is weird. Yeah, Mickey. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just wanted to comment. I appreciate this discussion a lot because it brings a lot of things into it for me to think about. Um, I too would like to enhance the other parks, which maybe have not been paid as much attention. Uh, I think that's really crucial uh, and, uh, and addressing some of the deferred maintenance. That's important. Regarding dog parks and fencing, I personally don't feel that the uh, one at Orchard Heights uh, needs to be fenced. It already has a fence along one way, and then it has all the trees and stuff along the other way. And in terms of the other amenities, it already has those amenities. Uh, I mean, it has the water, the dispensers, and stuff like that. So I wanted to put that out there. But one question I had was, again, in relation to the SDCs. For the Fisher Road Park development phase one, I was curious because it's in the master plan and, and it's also listed in the 309 list for a million and $250,000. And I was wondering if those are the same thing or not. Ah. Yes, it would be the same park. Uh, I would need to double check on the SDC eligibility there, but it does seem like it would meet that that requirement. So I will double check and we'll let you know and follow up with that info. Okay, thank you. So how would you like to, how would you like to deal with this parks issue? Would you like to take it to council, let them decide or how would you like to, no. Okay. Uh, no, I think we need to give them some advice. I, it's, I do uh, too. Yeah, <laughs> there's too many people to be having this level of detailed conversation. I would suggest, I'm just gonna toss it out. My colleagues can tell me that it's a crazy idea. I would like to suggest to staff, that we send staff uh, a way to do some, to do some work and bring these back in sort of do some subtotaling under the categories. You can list the various projects, but that we're only really considering the top line of each subtotal. You know, you can list the, like a shelter here, a shelter there, and, and but we're not, but really we're just looking at the number of the, the total amount for shelters. We're really not looking at the park specific list on shelters. Sort and of a the, such as. The same with parking lots and yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us some examples, such as, you know, yeah, okay. but not, we're not committing like, okay, we're going to buy a shelter here and a shelter here, but not there. Just give us some, some examples and just bring us those buckets and let's approve whatever it is, uh, shelters, athletic courts, parking lots, and playground equipment. If Maybe there's, I might be missing one, but just bring us those buckets with a number and we'll, because we're going to have to, we're going to be shaving some money off somewhere at some point in one of these conversations. Yeah. We can't adding. We got to do some subtraction soon, and that'll give us an opportunity to sub to subtract from specific areas or prioritize things into into ones or twos. Or I think that would be a way to move forward. And because I don't want to debate, you know, McKay School Park or Gear Park or you know, they all need it. And let's just yeah, let's make those decisions at a, in somewhat proximate time to when we're actually going to be able to 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 do the work. Okay, that's yeah. my suggestion. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, I think it would be very helpful as we start putting these final, these are the touchy pieces, I think, in terms of putting them together uh, to have that kind of information and maybe even options. I mean, staff know, you know what we're talking about, you know what our concerns are like, is sort of help us package this up in such a way 
that number one meets the obligation of the of the bond attorneys, uh, the the descriptions and all that. That also helps us tell the community we're looking at broad community resolution of some of these shared programs that, you know, everybody gets a bathroom, everybody gets a shelter, that we at least are leaving that on the line. To help us get there as close as we can get, I think, would be really helpful. And then I guess if the if the strategic strategic people, I don't know yeah. what, they, what their title is, when if those people tell us we need to be more specific that it may, to get this thing passed, well, I guess then we can actually list them out. But otherwise, right. I we're not to. Right. I think, well, I, I tell you, I think we're coming up to the next. Is that okay, Josh, for you to kind of, you guys to look at that this way? See if you can bring us really essentially a decision package or option one or two or however you would put it together to kind of get this thing. We need to get it into the into the council for a decision and one that you all can also live with that meets the legal obligation, that meets the kind of guidance you all need to do the work you do. Uh, I mean, we've got some balancing act here and we're probably not gonna be able to write it sitting here together like this. It just doesn't work well that way. So if you, does that make sense, Josh? It does. A couple couple quick questions just to make sure we bring you back what you're looking for. Uh, are we talking parks and streets and sidewalks or just mm -hmm. the parks category? We'll do streets and sidewalks nests. It may look the same, but okay. yeah, we may have the same discussion. Okay. But yeah, I, I this is this is just parks and parking lots and and dog parks and shelters and toilets and yeah, understood. Tennis, yeah. tennis courts and stuff. Yeah, Chris. And, and I would propose that we dedicate our next meeting to just this this transportation part of this whole deal and have this conversation because I, I think we're out of time now and I know. Yeah, I we are. So and, I would and, propose we just focus on that and get that list honed down. I think the transportation, you may also want to kind of take a look at it as to whether there are buckets there that might be better to talk about. Uh, because we're gonna have the same, exactly the same problem. In fact, probably in spades, people really care a lot about their streets and, and the uh, uh, associated infrastructure of sidewalks and bike lanes and all the rest of it, how that could be packaged up as well. Because I think, I think the same discussion follows uh, from this. Uh, yeah, I, I generally agree with that. I think we might have to list out some of the big ones if like yeah. we put Marine Drive, the Gold Crest, some of those things, but have to list mm -hmm. those. But I don't want to tell Peter, oh, you got to do this block to this block of right. uh, rehab of pavement. I want him to use his best professional judgment when that money is available to go repave the street that needs it the most. You know, yeah. I mean. The most, I think the, uh, a lot of that is just seeing how flexible you can get, but how, you know, how, what can we add through, what can we accomplish more through flexibility if we have some, uh, this, yeah, uh, Virginia. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I know um, in the last week or so when we've gotten this, I, that's how I've started, you know, <laughs> looking at the budget, how much for, you know, large street projects like Marine Drive or State Street, uh, how much for pedestrian infrastructure, how much for pavement R&R &R and bike lanes, right? Like just kind of sectioning it out like that. Um, so I would love to have that conversation next time. I would love to have some more uh, updated budget information for Marine Drive with that Fifth Street alignment, because it seems like the community is is really pushing for that alignment, and so I need to know how much that is going to, uh, how much that's going to cost or uh, save us, or what that does to the budget, um, because that's such a huge part of this. So I'm going to need more info on that one. Yeah, I am too. I'm going to want to know, and and maybe Mickey, you can help us out with this from your own perspective. Uh, how much of the community really has been consulted? I I appreciate neighborhood groups, but I also want to know that there was a real live consultation on this because that I think has been somewhat fluid and confusing. It is to me. Uh, I'm, I'm really often willing to go with just a neighborhood group, but that has been, uh, that has been a little chaotic over there. I want to make sure I understand we're looking at 
what that community wants and needs, not just what a group thinks they want and need. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I don't Does know. Does that make sense? To answer. Yeah, yeah. But this project has been in the work since uh, 97, and it was established as a, a local access project so that there could be future development right. there. Um, and that's really crucial. We haven't been looking ahead to things. And this is an instance where we are planning ahead. That's really, really important. Well, and I want to hear from the, I want to understand how that all fits together, that we're not, uh, that we're not favoring one group over another without knowing we're going to really have, you know, once you make a decision, all of a sudden you've got your whole negative group comes out of the, out of the weeds, you know, that we haven't heard from a group on some aspects. So I hope you can kind of pull that together for us a little bit as to, if, if we do this one, who jumps out of the weeds? If we do this one, who jumps out of the weeds? And okay. who's got the most, the most uh, votes? <laughs> okay, Virginia. Thank you. Sorry, we, I have to leave in a couple of minutes. So I just want to kind of rapid fire to uh, do uh, some things that I'm hoping staff can get back to me on. Um, I'd love to set up a meeting with you, Brian, about the State Street, uh, 13th to 17th Street, so that I can better understand that project. Um, and then I also would love to hear from the fire chief um, about the bridge rehabilitation. Uh, if we did those projects, would that um, shorten routes to areas that are in uh, really high time responses um, within the area for fire um, and emergency services? Um, again, don't have to answer me right now, but at the next meeting, that would be uh, really great. Um, and I think that's all of my questions and requests. The only other, the only other one I just mentioned real quickly is this bicycle thing, Virginia, you've been working on. Uh, will that be, is that part of this or are you looking at it somewhere else? Yeah, so for me and Ian and Dylan, what we wanted to do um, is that we just heard from so many different groups in different meetings that folks want bike lanes, right? Um, and oh, yeah. I, and I, what I wanted to do was, um, or we wanted to do is provide them with the vocabulary and the vision for what bike lanes, protected bike lanes okay. in Salem could look like. Um, and so if staff, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of support um, in our, in our community that we've set up for this. Um, and so I would love to see some money set aside in the, in the budget, one of those buckets for protected bike lanes. I would love to see that. Um, but you know, a lot of these projects that are on here, um, the okay. pavement R and R, those are all already in the bike plan, the bike vision that me and Dylan and Ian put forward. Um, if we can just redo the striping on that to include protected bike lanes, um, that would really go a long way to connect a lot of the bike infrastructure that we have and make it more accessible for everybody in every comfort level. Um, and then, you know, the things like the urban upgrades, these big streets that we're doing, those have bike lanes in them and to ensure that those are protected as well, right? So there's a lot of stuff in here already that, okay. it, that, it, that goes along with the plan that I put forward. Um, and so I'm hoping that uh, one, the community can see themselves riding a bike in my plan, <laughs> in our plan uh, vision that we put forward. And, um, and, I, and I hope that we can have a bucket just for protected bike lanes as we move forward. Okay, so we're not gonna see a, that as coming to as a package into this, trying to put it into this plan. Um, not that I understand. I would, you know, I think that I, I wasn't really... very clear. I, I appreciate you clarifying it. Thank you. I like, like the approach you're taking. It sounds good to me. Yeah, because, you know, that would be asking a lot of staff in such a short timeline. So I would just like to see yeah. money put aside for these projects in the future. Well, with our Salem, we've got the uh, transportation system plan coming up. You're going to have lots of time over the next decade to debate this one. Okay, sounds good. Well then, uh, Courtney, is there anything else? Uh, no, I think we're all clear. I understand what the intent is and I've got a whole bunch of um, notes about particular yeah. questions that you would like to have answers to. For me, I'd just like to make sure you're aware the next bond meeting is scheduled April 15th from one to 2.30. I have okay. two observations I'd like to make about that. One, I wonder if we need more time. Yep. And two, I wonder if you want me to engage um, the polling firm and 
our um, yes. stakeholder group for, for this next meeting as well. Yeah, I, I think both of those final elements need to be included because if we had, we're going to head, we've got to be completing this and getting it to the council. So we're, if, if we don't have the resource there, we can't do it. We can't close that loop. Um, and yes, we need more time. Uh, I think to finish this up, we ought to have two hours at a minimum and at least give us the schedule that if we're cut loose early, great. But today it's 15 minutes more of our lives devoted to this that we didn't anticipate, so. Excellent, so we'll focus on the transportation elements. We'll get all of the answers to you in advance from the questions that were collected today. Focus on transportation and have our- And parks. Um, parks, We'll sorry. work on parks, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, if you have any questions, you can call any one of us. I think we all understand what we're after here. We do, thank you.